Well, my name is Heather Fallen and I am with Fallen Into Camping based in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, I'm so excited to be able to do this presentation on water damage for you guys today. So I hope you find it helpful. Um, I've been renovating and flipping campers for a few years now, so I have learned a thing or two about water damage. Um, a little bit about me, I have three boys and have been married to my husband for almost 10 years. Uh, I do specialize in custom woodworking, plumbing, electrical, and mechanical. Um, I also love vintage Yamaha motorcycles. I have an 82 Yamaha Maxim XJ1100, so uh, if you're into motorcycles, that's also right up my alley. <laughs> um, I have also expanded into client renovations, and I'm super excited about that. So I'll be taking on my first client here in the next few months once I work out the legal logistics of that. Um, if you guys have questions during my presentation, just feel free to ask me and I will do my best to respond. So let's go ahead and get started. Hey y'all, um, I am so glad to be here today to give you this presentation. Um, I'm gonna go over water damage repairs on your floors, walls, ceiling, and your roof. Um, so just let me know if you have any questions. Now, I wanted to begin by saying there is life after water damage. So this camper had extensive floor, wall, and roof damage, and now it is better than new um, and sold in 24 hours, which was awesome. So um, if you get discouraged easily or you're just not really sure, um, you know, where you're headed, this is just a good reminder that just because you have water damage doesn't mean that your camper won't look like new again. Now, I've tried to simplify this in the best way possible, so I broke water damage repairs down into six categories. So these principles will be used for all types of repairs and they're really the core of all water damage repair. Um, I'll go into each one of these in more detail, but the six R's of water damage include resealing your camper, removing the damaged wood, reframing, reconfiguring your electrical, R13, which is a type of insulation, um, and then replace, which is adding new paneling or OSB. Now, before you think about starting on repairs, you need to make sure that the leak has stopped and there's no more water intrusion. So you need to locate where the water is coming in and then reseal that area. Common places for leaks are windows, exterior lights, and basically all corners and edges of the camper. Um, as you can see in this picture, the water was coming in from the roof um, in this little gap right there and was leaking all the way down into the ceiling and created a pretty nice soft spot in the ceiling that I had to replace. Um, so that's all it takes is one small gap to have some pretty extensive damage. Now next, you're gonna to wanna to remove any rotten wood or insulation. Um, make sure to take a picture of your framing so you can have an idea of how it all goes back together. Um, a multi-tool is really great for cutting in tight spaces where you're kind of trimming off the rotten wood of your framing. Um, and it's gonna help you control your cuts and not dig into the aluminum or fiberglass siding. You'll also want to clean up your studs, um, trusses or joists by removing any nails, staples, or glue from your frame. Now, after all of your damaged wood and framing is removed, you're going to want to rebuild your frame. Um, I usually like to work piece by piece until all the framing is repaired. Definitely refer back to that picture that you took your framing so you can have an idea of how it all goes back together. Uh, so basically, I measured the dimensions of my original framing and ripped down two by fours to that same size to rebuild it. Um, I use overlapping and stagger joints to join the new wood into the existing framing. Um, I'll go into more detail about what I call a buddy joint in a few minutes, so definitely keep that in the back of your mind. Now, if you're repairing frame damage, most likely you will have to reroute and reconfigure your electrical wires. Uh, so campers have a 12 volt and 120 volt system. Uh, basically, your 12 volt wires are going to be really small, your 120 volt wires are going to be much larger, they're usually um, encased in uh, white or uh, yellow, as you can see in the picture, there's both in that picture, and the 120 volt will have three separate wires in them. There's going to be a black, a white, and then there's a copper for the ground. Um, so you'll be able to tell the difference if it's a 12 or 120 volt. Now, do your best not to cut the wires, especially if it's 120 volt. Uh, try to feed them back through the wall or the floor or wherever if possible, um, and then reroute them to where they need to go. 
Um, but if you have to cut them, I highly recommend that you learn how to solder. I do have a video on my YouTube about how to solder wires back together, but there's lots of good videos all over YouTube about soldering wires. Um, and my main reasoning for that is uh, you don't want to have to be digging through your wall or your ceiling or your floors because your wire nut came off and your wires aren't connected anymore and something's not working. So if it's going in anything that I'm not going to be able to get to easily, always solder it. Um, now, always uh, feed your electrical through the framing. Never add paneling or floor or ceiling directly on top of electrical wires because then you run the risk of pinching it and then you're definitely going to have some electrical issues after that. Now I like to use R13 insulation. It is inexpensive and it works really well. So floors and ceilings will use a full roll of insulation and for the walls you'll need to tear the thickness in half. So your last step is going to be to replace. Um, you're going to add a new piece of paneling or OSB over the framing that you just repaired. Uh, basically measure and draw out your piece, cut it, test fit it, and then use construction adhesive and uh, to glue the wood onto the frame and then you can use staples or screws to secure it. Now this is very important. Um, if you don't listen to anything else in this entire presentation, listen to this slide. So first you're going to make sure that your camper is unplugged and your battery is disconnected. Um, you can even go as far as flipping your breakers off just to be safe. Uh, the, my, my reasoning for that is because you don't want to electrocute yourself because chances are you will be dealing with um, electricity, your wires, all that fun stuff. So unplug your camper, don't electrocute yourself. Um, next, always try to work in four by eight sections, always. Um, so campers are built using four by eight sheets and it's a lot easier to replace the whole panel than it is to cut small sections out and try to repair it that way. Um, it's also going to make your camper look like there was never any water damage at all if you repair it based on the dimensions that the manufacturer built on. Last, always split the framing when repairing water damage. Well, what does that mean? Let me show you a few examples. So let's look at a wall first. You can see the highlighted areas where the studs are, which are evenly spaced four feet apart. Um, when you go to reinstall a new panel, the edge of one side will be nailed to the right half of the stud where my white arrow is, while the other side of the panel will be nailed to the left side of this other stud, uh, which is the other white arrow. Next, we have a picture of the floor. Um, if you look at the highlighted areas, you'll see that I made my cuts, so only half of the joists were exposed. Um, that way the original wood can still rest on the left half of the joist, which is the arrow in red, um, and my new piece can rest on the right half of the joist, which is the arrow in white. Now the same principle applies to the ceiling. So in this picture, half of the ceiling panel will rest towards the front of the camper on this truss right here, and then half of it will rest towards the back of the camper. So if you look on the roof, um, the trusses will be spaced evenly so the OSB can rest on each half of the trusses. Um, so you guessed it, four feet apart. In this example, half of the OSB will rest on the right side of the truss where my white arrow just is, and the other half will rest on the front support that's highlighted in yellow, and there's also a white arrow right there. Okay, now that we have some basics of repairing water damage, um, we'll go into uh, each specific category. So we're going to start with floors because it's the easiest and we'll work our, our way all the way up to the roof. Now these are some basic materials you need to repair water damage on your floor. Um, keep in mind that the 5 8 inch OSB may not be what size your subfloor is. So make sure to measure how thick your specific camper subfloor is and buy the materials to match. Um, you'll also need a full sheet of R13 and some deck screws. You can really use any screws that you want, but I like the deck screws because they sink well if you drill a pilot hole and uh, they're made for outside. So if you ever do have water damage later on, then your screws are not going to rust and it just makes it a lot easier to take it all back apart. So as you can see, this floor had some pretty significant water damage. Uh, this is actually the floor from the video that I showed y'all at the beginning of the presentation. 
So first I determined the leak was coming from a piece of trim that wasn't caulked on the exterior of the camper right about there where that yellow just showed up. Um, so whenever it would rain, the water would just come down the front of the camper and basically go directly into the floor for a long time. Um, now the first thing I do is look for that four foot seam because I like to work in four by eight sections. Um, so relative to where the water damage is, in this case, it makes the most sense for me to remove the whole four by eight section and then trim off the excess rot that are towards the walls. So if you see the yellow that just popped up, you see there's a line going down um, the middle of the floor there. That is my four foot section. Um, so I ended up removing all of that. So basically to remove the flooring, I just use my circular saw set to a, a little bit more than 5 eighths of an inch um, and just cut some straight lines. So I go a little bit past where the water damage is because the wood could still be wet even though it doesn't look rotten. Um, so there's my first section I did, which is four by roughly eight, it's a little short of an eight. Um, but then in the white, you see there's two sections right there that I cut that I went a little further. Um, it didn't make much sense for me to do another four by eight sheet. So I did those two smaller sections right there. After my subfloor was removed, I used my multi-tool to cut off the rot and the wet wood that was on the joists. Um, in this case, I had to cut my electrical wires because they were fed through the joists. Um, and the, it actually went to the slide and I didn't wanna feed them up through the floor. Um, in the slide, so I just ended up cutting them. It was a lot easier. So now that all of my uh, rot was out, uh, I basically measured the dimensions of my original floor joists and ripped a bunch of two by fours to the same size. Now I started around the edges under the walls and then um, worked my way towards the middle of the camper. Uh, be sure to replace the anchor bolts if you're repairing any damage underneath the frame of the walls. Uh, I cut the old bolts off with an angle grinder and then added new bolts by drilling a hole from the outside frame up into the camper. So I had anchor bolts right here and then there's one right there and right there and then one right there. Um, so they basically hold the walls to the steel frame of the camper. So definitely make sure to replace those. Um, if you look at the yellow highlighted areas, this is where I created uh, a buddy joint that I was telling you guys about before. Uh, where my old joist will meet my new joist. So I use pocket holes to initially join the two pieces of wood, which are the areas in the arrows in white right there is where I have my pocket holes. Um, and then I used a really long scrap piece of the same size to screw into the new and the old joist as additional support. So if you look at the arrows in green, that is where I put screws in to join that long piece from my old joist to my new joist. Um, I also fed my electrical wires back through the joists and soldered the wires back together. Um, so again, I highly recommend soldering if you don't know how to do this. There's a bunch of really good uh, videos on YouTube on soldering. Um, and I didn't want to have to mess with, you know, the take a risk of it not working, especially since it was the slide. Now, after your framing is complete and repaired, you will add a full roll of R13 insulation. Um, you basically just measure and cut your new piece of subfloor after that and install using pilot holes and deck screws. I do not use construction adhesive on flooring, but you're more than welcome to if that's what you wanna do. Okay, so next I will walk you through the steps to repairing your walls and I have some really good videos on this too. So some basic materials needed for wall repair include eighth inch paneling, a half sheet of R13 insulation, construction adhesive, and staples. I chose the eighth inch paneling instead of the five millimeter underlayment because the eighth inch um, is basically the thickness that is originally in campers. It's how they build it. Uh, so it creates a smooth seam when joining your new piece in your existing piece of paneling. Um, now, the exception to the rule for these supplies is if you have an aluminum frame. Now, I am specifically talking about water damage for wood frames. So if you have an aluminum frame, these supplies will not work um, nearly as well for you. I have actually never worked on a camper with an aluminum frame. I have not gotten that lucky. 
Um, but if you have questions on, you know, how to fasten your paneling to an aluminum frame, um, I'd be happy to do some research and see what I can find um, as far as staples or what other people have used in order to, um, you know, kind of attach your paneling to the, uh, the frame that you have. Now I'll start by removing the damaged panel. Notice I removed the whole forefoot section. Um, so after that, I'll remove all of the staples and any of the glue that are on the studs. I didn't have any frame damage in this camper, so I skipped the framing and insulation step. Next, I measured and cut out my wall panel. Make sure to measure out for any outlets as well because you'll need um, to position those correctly. I use my circular saw and a saw guide to get nice straight edges. Um, you know, after that, I test my panel and if I'm happy with it, I use construction adhesive and my staple gun to secure it to the studs. Um, it's always a good idea to mark your studs as well if you don't know where they are. That way you'll have a nice vantage point from A to B where you can kind of draw a chalk line and know where to put your staples in. Um, now there's another clip that's about to come up and I included this in case you have water damage where you have a window. Um, so basically all of the process is going to be the same. Um, the one difference is I do not cut out the part where the window is as you can see. So I'm stapling it in right there and then I actually um, I get my router with a flush trim bit set at the right depth and then I'll stick my router in the window and I will router out the edge of the window. Makes a perfect cut every time, way easier than try to like eyeball it or anything else like that. You see how easily the router just cuts it out and then I just go back and put some staples around the edges and call it a day. Um, so if you don't have a router or a flush trim bit, I highly suggest looking into getting those because they are great tools when renovating campers. Um, I use my router a lot with, um, you know, water damage repair, like a lot. <laughs> now let's talk a little bit more about framing in the walls. It's the same principle as framing on the floor. So the picture to the left, the area highlighted in yellow is what I replaced. Um, I basically replaced the entire stud going vertically and the piece going horizontally. So I used pocket holes to screw the top and bottom into the existing framing and then added the support in the middle to stabilize it. Now the picture on the right shows uh, a camper that I worked on with pretty extensive water damage. I ended up reframing the entire left side of that wall, but if you look where the arrows are pointed, it didn't need a full replacement. So I cut the damaged wood out with my multi-tool, went a little bit past what I thought was rotten, um, and added a new piece in with some pocket holes and then added that buddy joint, which consisted of screwing a long piece of wood into the existing stud and the new stud. Now the ceiling gets a little more complicated because sometimes it requires electrical and ductwork planning, um, but the principle is still basically the same. These are some basic materials you'll need to repair your ceiling. Um, five millimeter plywood underlayment is what I use, um, a full roll of R13 insulation, construction adhesive, and staples. Now I use the five millimeter underlayment because it's a little thicker than the eighth inch paneling and you don't really see as many dips in the ceiling. Plus I am not a huge fan of MDF, so anytime I can stay away from it, I'm definitely gonna take it. Um, now again, the exception to this rule is aluminum frame. This is specifically for wood frame, um, so I would not try to use um, you know, the staples in the aluminum frame because it probably won't do anything, but I don't know, I've never tried. So uh, your first step is gonna wanna be to remove any cabinets that are attached to the ceiling panel that you need to remove. Notice I am working in four foot sections again. Um, after your cabinets are removed, you can proceed to take the panel down. I use my multi-tool to score the edges of the panel because when the campers are built, they put the ceiling down first and then the trusses, so the panels are actually made underneath the trusses. Um, now, after your panel is down, be sure to keep an eye out for where the electrical goes um, and just kind of take it off right there and throw that panel out. Then you can start removing any nails or staples and basically just clean up your trusses um, and double and triple check to make sure you have no more staples. 
Um, you're then going to want to mark all of the locations of the trusses on your wall. This just gives you a vantage point from A to B to know where to put your staples once you put your new panel up. Um, you're also going to want to put in your insulation. Um, as you can see in the video, my very sophisticated way of hanging insulation is using electrical tape. <laughs> And after you've got your insulation up, you are then ready to basically uh, measure and make a map of what uh, holes you need for your electrical and your ductwork. Um, so I make a map on a piece of paper, just double and triple check where everything needs to go. Um, I do cut out my panel with a circular saw and a saw guide um, and basically just measure where all of the electrical and ductwork goes and go from there. Um, so it's actually pretty easy to do. Yep, and there's my little map right there, which is great. Um, there's my five millimeter plywood. Cut it out according to your map. My circular saw with my saw guide. Um, I would highly suggest cutting your panel upside down because you're going to have one side that's going to have a rough cut on it, and you're going to want that part to go up in your ceiling. That way you have a nice smooth finish. Um, it just makes it look a lot cleaner. Even though it's going to be covered up with trim, I still like to do it just to be on the safe side. Um, now, I do use a hole saw to cut the holes for the electrical and ductwork, um, and my reasoning for that is um, it just, it's a really easy way to make sure everything's lined up. Um, so after your holes are cut, you're going to want to go and test fit, make sure your electrical lines up where it needs to be and your panel fits, um, and then you're going to grab a friend, oh, actually, no, construction adhesive first, and then grab a helper. Uh, so just put construction adhesive all over um, your trusses, make sure it's nice and good on there. And then you can grab a friend to help you, um, position your panel in place, feed the electrical through your panel, and make sure to line it up so half of the panel is on one side of the truss and the other side of your panel is on the other half of the truss. Um, and then after that, you can start to staple your panel in position. Um, and then just kind of get it tacked up there. Um, and then you can get a chalk line and put it from your truss marks on the wall to know exactly where your trusses are. Um, I didn't do a chalk line because my mom ran away and I've replaced so many ceilings, I can just eyeball it by now. Um, and then uh, you can grab a router with a flush trim bit and use the foam inside the ductwork to kind of guide yourself on how big to make the hole. So, yep, and there is my router. Just kind of eyeball it and ride around the holes and call it a day. All right, last but not least, let's go over roof damage. Um, this is by far the most tedious and time consuming type of water damage to repair. I get this question a lot. So how do I know if I need to replace or reseal my roof? My simple answer is if your roof looks anything like the picture, it needs to be replaced. So rubber roof skins only have a lifespan of about 10 years. So if your camper is older than that with an original roof, it's time to start thinking about replacing your skin. Resealing it will only help with heat deflection and rubber conditioning and not with water intrusion. Uh, it's a huge misconception that adding a rubber roof coating to an old roof help makes it waterproof. I cannot tell you how many roofs I have replaced where the owners told me they resealed it and don't understand why the ceiling is caving in from a leak. Um, also, personally, as a flipper, if I'm going to sell a camper that's 20 years old for the price of a new camper, I'm definitely going to make sure that the roof and all of the vents are brand new. Um, you know, this is just my opinion, my two cents, but I have replaced countless roofs over the years. It's something that I always, always, always do. Um, and you can only reseal something so many times. I mean, it's like putting lipstick on a pig. You can only do it so many times before somebody realizes that that's a bad roof. Um, and if you see the black patches on the skin right there, that's basically where all of the rubber has worn away. And that basically the um, underlayment part of the roof is showing and it's exposed. Um, and there's really not much you can do after that point because resealing it will, I mean, it's a, it's such a, a small thickness of what you'll put on when you roll it on. It just, it really does not work and does not do anything. 
Now, just for entertainment, I'm going to run through the whole wood repair process and the basics of replacing the skin. So for repairing the wood, you'll need 7 16 OSB, some 2x4s, and some deck screws to start. Now keep in mind your wood thickness may be different than 7 16 on your roof, to, so make sure to measure um, the exact thickness of your specific roof and replace it with the same thickness. Now again, the exception to this is the aluminum frame. Um, you know, I, I would suggest looking to see what they fastened the roof, uh, the wood on the roof with, um, and kind of go from there to see how they did it on that roof. Um, now, this is a picture of a roof that I did. Again, working in four foot sections, start at wherever your water damage is located. In this case, it was the entire roof. Uh, so you can see in the yellow that just popped up, those are the four foot sections that I worked on in this roof. I started my way at the back and worked my way forward four feet at a time. Uh, you can do this either way. You can start at the front and work your way back, which is usually how they're made. Uh, but I did not do that in this camper because as you can see in the front, um, let me get my pointer here, right here, uh, it was... There's, there's no wood left at all. I couldn't stand on it, um, and it's really hard to rebuild a roof when you're not standing directly on top of it. So the back was um, in a little better shape, so I started from the back and worked my way forward. You will have a um, shorter piece um, either on the front or the back, so as long as you space your trusses out evenly so your OSB lines up, then you'll be good to go. Now, depending on your location, you may not have to do all these steps, but I'm going to run you through a total skin replacement, um, and you can take from it what you need. So the first step is to remove your awning. If you have a fifth wheel, the awning won't have to come off because it's not attached to the side rails, which is great. But for pull-behinds, the awning needs to come off. Now, um, search on YouTube for your specific camper because the removal process will be different if you have a manual or automatic awning. Now, after that, you're going to want to remove your side rails. Um, there's a plastic trim, screw trim cover that you'll remove and then take out the screws one by one. You can then use a putty knife to loosen the side rails, um, and they should come off fairly easily. Try not to bend them because you will need to reuse them. Um, you'll also need to remove all the vents and the AC unit, and there's lots of good videos on YouTube on how to remove those. You can then start to peel back the old skin, working section by section. I just cut it with a razor blade and just start peeling. Um, so this is the part of the process where you burn 100,000 calories in 30 minutes and start to question your life choices um, because it does take a long time. It doesn't feel like a long time. It's only like 30 minutes is how long it took me to do this, but I burned a lot of calories and I was super tired. Um, yep. Right about there, right about there, halfway through the roof is where you start to question your life choices. Why did I start running mini campers? Why did I sell, why, why, why am I doing this? I don't, I don't understand. This is probably the worst part of it. Um, <laughs> but after the skin is removed, you can start removing your damaged wood, um, working in four foot sections again. Um, the OSB is nailed down. So start at an edge with a crowbar and a hammer and just kind of work your way around um, until the piece starts to come up. Now, if you've seen the video, I have a truss that came up right there because it was rotten. So watch out for that and watch out for any electrical that decides to come up with it like I have in this piece. Um, so you're basically just going to have to work out whatever is rotten. Just work it out, work the um, nails up because it is lots of nails. And then eventually you can just work at it and it'll come up. And then I like to throw it off the roof. <laughs> there it goes. Now, if you are replacing your trusses, um, make sure that they are spaced correctly. So it should measure exactly four feet from the middle of one truss to the middle of another truss. Um, now, there's another reason I only work four feet at a time because when you take the structural integrity of the roof off of the camper, four foot at a time, your walls are gonna go like this. They're gonna flop out. Okay, so if you see on this picture on the right, um, I have a ratchet strap, and I put a ratchet strap from one side of the camper to the other, and I kind of just tighten it until my walls cave back up and straight to how they're supposed to be. So that's a really good tip right there, that way your walls aren't crooked. 
Now let's talk about trusses. Um, I make my own using a jig that I made a few years ago. All of the campers that I have replaced trusses with have been the same measurement, so thankfully I've been able to use the same pattern that I made. Um, now to make your own trusses, you need to take a truss from your camper that isn't severely damaged and basically make an exact replica of it. If you don't know how to do this, any woodworker or general contractor should be able to recreate one if you give them one of your old trusses. Um, I make them out of two by fours, so it's fairly inexpensive to make. It's just a little bit of time consuming because the edges and blocks are angled to make the curve on the trusses in the correct position. Um, now I will say I do not like to cut trusses or anything like that. If I'm gonna replace a truss or if it's rotten, um, you know, more than something on the edge, I will replace the whole truss. Uh, and my reasoning for that is it kind of gives up the structural integrity of a truss when you cut one side off just because of the way they're made and the way that they are bent to shape. Now, if you have a situation where only the very corners of your trusses are rotten, you can actually rip down some two by fours to the exact dimensions of the lower part of your truss and basically just add a support on both sides uh, where the red highlighter is right there. Um, you're basically just gonna make a little buddy to go up alongside the truss to support it. Um, then you can screw the new wood into the truss. As you can see where my arrows are pointing, that is the direction you're gonna wanna put your screws to go in the trusses in the correct position. Now, one thing to note, if you have roof water damage over cabinets like this picture right here, you'll need to unscrew your cabinets from the ceiling from the inside of the camper. Um, after your wood is removed, make sure to remove any staples from the roof side where that yellow is right there. Um, you're going to want that to be as clean and as smooth as possible. Now, after any structural issues are repaired, you can go ahead and put your new piece of OSB on the roof. Um, I put center blocks on each side to bend the OSB a little bit so I can screw it into the trusses. Um, again, make sure you drill some pilot holes if you're going to use those deck screws um, just so you can kind of sink them in really good because you don't want your screws to be sticking up because it can actually poke through the PVC skin. Now, the only holes in the roof that I pre-cut are the plumbing vents. Any other holes, I add a whole sheet to the roof, and then I go from the inside and drill a pilot hole that I then stick my flush trim bit in and just router out the shape of the vent. Um, and that way, it just makes my life a whole lot easier, and it's the perfect cut each time, and I don't have to worry about the hole being off or anything else like that. Um, so the router is a great tool with a flush trim bit if you don't have one. Okay, now for the fun part. So after your roof is repaired, it's time to apply your new skin. So first you need to tape all of your joints and seams with duct tape. Uh, I like to use Gorilla Tape. It's a little stronger and it holds up really well. Um, so make sure to tape any areas with screws as well as around vents. Now the ideal temperature is between 70 and 75 degrees. Any colder and your glue will take a really long time to settle and dry. Uh, make sure to blow and clean off your roof of any debris. Next, you can roll out the skin, the entire length of your roof, uh, readjust it if needed, and I like to work half a section at a time. Um, so once you've got it rolled out, roll, I roll the front back halfway, um, and then I will pour some glue out and spread it with a paint roller. Um, you don't have to use anything fancy here, just a regular paint roller will do. Um, as you can see, I keep my glue separate until I roll it out. It just makes life a little bit easier. So just dump it, roll it, and then hop back over to that middle section and start working your way and smoothing it out. Um, you will smooth out any air bubbles as you go section by section. Um, so work your way all the way to the front, and then I trim the excess skin off of the back of the camper and then roll the back half towards the middle part where you've already started. Um, and then same thing, pour out the glue, repeat the same process as the front half. Um, so it's, it's not super time consuming, it's just a matter of having a little bit of patience to work out those air bubbles. Um, you know, I don't have any special tool I use other than I just kind of smooth it out with my hands. And if the temperature's right, the bubbles will basically just settle themselves out anyway, which is great. 
Now, after you finish, make sure to mark your vents with a Sharpie with a big X. That way you don't accidentally fall through your camper because that would not be good. We don't want that. <laughs> Okay, now after your skin is glued on, um, you're going to want to clean your side rails, um, the front, the back, and both side rails. Um, apply new butyl tape and reinstall with new screws. Don't forget your screw trim cover. Um, that's pretty cheap. You can buy like 100 feet on Amazon for like $15. Um, you're also going to want to cut the holes for your vents with a razor blade in an X pattern. Um, staple the skin to the inside of the framing of your camper and install your new vents and then reinstall your awning. Um, here I have laid out some basic supplies for the skin. If you're replacing your skin altogether, I highly recommend the PVC roof kit, which includes everything, uh, the skin, the adhesive, the butyl tape, and the self-leveling sealant. Now I use PVC to replace the skins on my camper for several reasons. Um, PVC skins have a 10-year warranty and are used on a lot of commercial buildings. Uh, they don't ever have to re be resealed, which is great. And if you ever like back into a tree branch or you get a tear or a rip in your roof, you basically just get an extra piece of that skin that you cut off the back and you can glue it over the existing skin. You don't have to peel it up. You don't have to remove any of your side rails. You don't have to do any of that. You can basically just put a patch over it with PVC glue and call it a day. It is great. Um, now, if you're not replacing your skin and you're just kind of peeling it back to repair the water damage and then putting it back the way it was, you will need um, acrylic adhesive to glue your skin back down, uh, butyl tape to reseal your side rails, and the self-leveling sealant um, to seal the side rails, the front and back rails, and all of the vents that are on your camper. Now here is some good preventative maintenance tips just to, you know, help keep away the water damage um, because we all know campers are very prone to water damage. So these just kind of help um, put the odds ever in your favor, so to say. Um, first, you're going to want to walk your roof. Just get up there. Um, you know, inspect it for rips, tears, any holes in your sealant. Uh, just give it a good look over about every three months. That way, if there is something that has a problem area, you'll be able to notice it. Um, another common thing for roof is the cap on your roof vents fly off a lot. Um, I've seen that so many times. So it's a good idea to just get up there and look at it because that's not something that you can see standing on the ground. Um, another thing is sealing your windows. So naturally over time, the sealant on the window dries out. So it's a good idea to reseal your windows every four or five years. Um, that's a huge area where campers leak. Um, just about every camper I have ever done has always had a window leak every single time. So just as preventative maintenance, reseal it every four to five years. I do have a video on YouTube and on my Instagram on how to reseal a window in your camper, so check that out. Um, now, pressure test. Before opening your camper up for the season, um, you're going to want to pressure test it and make sure that none of your lines have busted in the wintertime. So to do that, they actually make a special fitting that screws into your water hose. Um, and then you get a uh, air compressor set at about 15 20 psi hook the air compressor hose up and that way if you walk in your camper it's going to be hissing you're going to be able to abundantly tell if there is a water leak um, so that is way better to do it that way than hook your water up and turn it on and then your camper be flooded with water. Um, so if you don't have that type of fitting, I would highly suggest looking into buying it. It's a great asset to have for any RVer. Um, also, uh, replacing the O-rings if necessary. So your water lines have these little cone washers inside of them that, um, you know, they dry out over time. I've, I've seen it a million times. You know, if you have a water leak inside your camper, um, and it's coming from your plumbing where you screw the, uh, you know, where, where it screws into a fitting or something like that. Um, absolutely check your O-rings and replace those if needed. The only place that I have really found the right O-rings is um, Ace Hardware, surprisingly. They do sell them in the store. They're like, 
a dollar an o-ring but i always keep some handy because you never know when you're going to need it um so yeah those are just some pretty good preventative maintenance things that you know just keep it in the back of your mind that way you won't have to repair water damage hopefully down the road <laughs> And I think that is it for me, guys. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. I am on Instagram. That is my YouTube channel right there, also Fallen Into Camping. And there is my Gmail. If you have any questions or you need to email me, just feel free to reach out. Um, and I will do my best to respond to you guys. I hope you enjoy the rest of the summit. And I can't wait to um, see the other presenters. Y'all have a good day.